Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Real Me In, colon, a movie podcast where you didn't really ask for it, but hey, I'm going to give it to you anyways. This is a podcast where I talk about anything, everything, and anything about movies. I'm your host Chase Lee and hey guys, listen, uh, if you were searching on the internet for some like weird, I don't know, like midget and donkey porn and you accidentally came across my, uh, my podcast and you're not a movie fan, well hopefully I can convince you to be one, even with your sick fantasies. <laughs> this is episode 155 guys, uh... Uh, what I do on the show, if you are new, uh, welcome once again. I will go over some movie news that drop throughout the week, some movie trailers that drop throughout the week, have my review of a specific movie or movies of the uh, the weekend releases and box office results for the weekend, and then we wrap up, close shop, and go home. Um, yeah, and uh, just to let you guys know, this is episode 155, and so that means next week, next fucking week, will be the three-year anniversary of this shit fest on this show. Holy shit. Uh, and my guest is shaking his head. So, anyways, I'm not alone today. I am uh, uh, joined by my uh, top five Saturdays Live uh, uh, co host. And uh, uh, he's been one of my main peeps for uh, shit. Too many, so many years. So many years. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, Brian Sudfield is back. Uh, Brian, uh, what is going on? I'm doing very well, and you know what's so funny? Like, I calculated when was the last time I was on. The last time I was on was episode 106, which was when you reviewed Creed and The Good Dinosaur, which was almost a year ago, like almost a year ago. And that was, to calculate, 49 episodes ago. So, yeah, almost a year ago. And um, I'm doing very well. Um, Last time I was on here, I was a senior in high school. Now I'm in college. And, you know, it's fun, it's tiring, but it's college, and I'm doing very well. I'm really excited to be back on Real Me, and it's been quite a minute since I was last on. Yeah, and, and all those people out there listening, they're probably like, dear God, he hasn't been on in a year, have you guys not talked? No, no, I, I talk to this motherfucker like every week, single week, because we have a show to do every single week, so. Uh, but no, he's he's got shit to do, guys, he's in college. I was I was a youngin, I know what that's like, so if, if he wants to go party on saturday night and not want to do shit on sunday guess what i understand so <laughs> yeah and also the thing is like i had a podcast when like within the last year i had nerdy scores i couldn't come on to the show now i do a different podcast which is on thursday so even if i wanted to come on here i mean if chase allows me to come on i will certainly come on it's just the reason why i haven't been on in a year was because i did nerdy scores and i couldn't come on because basically our shows were pretty much the same so i didn't want to come on because it would have been the same as nerdy scores yeah i i totally get that it uh so, sometimes uh if i start talking about the same thing more than once uh i get tired of it so but uh yeah uh welcome once again everyone listening so without uh any further ado let's get this shit started and before we get started um i'll just let you guys know i might be a little slow today uh, i went to a wedding last night so this episode is dedicated to my uh um, newly uh, wedded couple, uh, Jonathan and Reagan Paulson. That uh, that is where I was last night, and I might be a little hungover. But however, I'm gonna get through this like a champ because you guys deserve the very best quality content on your drive to work. If you're listening to this at the gym, or if you're like taking a shit and listen to this, I got you, fam. I fucking got you. So let's begin, folks. Let's start with some movie news, guys. Um, not that much to drop this week. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave the 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 biggest piece of news uh, for the very end, but uh, one of the news stories is kind of fascinating. Uh, good old, um, if you guys uh, know the band Queen, Freddie Mercury was the uh, the front man, the lead singer. He was uh, uh, regarded as one of the best uh, front men of all time, and uh, he is very beloved by many, many, many people, including myself. I, I love uh, Queen and their music. So his biopic is going to come out. And at first, it was supposed to be Sasha Baron Cohen, and that was actually a pretty great pick, considering if you put their pictures side by side, they look alike. You put you slap a mustache on Sasha, like that is like <laughs> that is like a one hundred percent accurate. Now that he's dropped, they were looking for someone new, and so who they uh, find a uh, uh, find uh, you know getting and whatnot is um, uh, Rami Malek from uh, good old uh, Mr. Robot. Uh, the TV show on USA, and uh, I gotta tell you, this is a pretty good pick. Uh, Because, okay, 
you can look at it from two different ways. Is that one, he's really good in Mr. Robot. I've only seen four episodes of it, but the guy is electrifying. Like, he commands the screen, so his acting presence is there. His charm, I'm going to name drop a movie and you're going to fucking shake your head, but hear me out. Need for Speed. Not a very good movie, but he was pretty fucking charming in that that film. He was kind of like the comedic relief, and uh, I, I remember his... Um, his ass, because I remember that streaking scene, dear Lord. Uh, so, um, yeah, anyways, uh, he was very uh, likable in that film. He's very charming, so I think he could actually bring the, uh, uh, you know, ferocity as a front man to play in a biopic. So I actually think it's a pretty good choice, and the guy's got an Emmy. So you know he's going to bring the acting talent, and he's probably going to get an Oscar nomination if this film turns out correctly. So, Brian, what say you? Do you think Rami can do it and have you seen Mr. Robot and do you think this is a good pick? You know, for someone who hasn't even gotten around to watching it yet, because that's one of those shows that's really high up on my watch list, um, I think this is an awesome pick. I mean, like you said, he's he's an Emmy winner. He just won the Emmy for this show. From the clips that I've seen, from the glimpse I've seen, my mother watches the show. From the times I've seen her watch this and I've seen clips of his character, I'm like, you know, this guy's pretty fucking talented. And like you brought me for speed – now, yes, I mean, not a good film. He did have a lot of charm in that movie. He also was charming in the Night of the Museum films as that True. as that Emperor Pharaoh. Wait, wait, thing. Was, he, was he King Tut? No, he was Akmana. Oh, Akmana. I, I, the, yeah, <laughs> I think I think that was his name. <laughs> yeah, he was like and also another big news story that dropped with this, even though it's not as big as this, was that apparently the guy that's gonna be held in this film is Brian Singer, which is something that no one expected i mean no one ever heard that his name was attached to this project and um yeah but to continue to talk about Rami malik i think he's gonna add a lot of charm and like awesomeness to the Freddie mercury because like you i'm a huge fan of queen as well i would have loved to have seen sasha baron cohen playing this role but of course controversies and financial and business stuff it's annoying but hey i think Rami malik is going to be a perfect Freddie mercury and but brian singer directing it that sounds pretty awesome, and it's nice to see him do stuff outside of X-Men because, I mean, obviously he did Usual Suspects. He did Valkyrie with Tom Cruise. Now he's doing this, so, I mean, that's pretty fucking awesome. So, yeah, I'm excited to see how Rami Malek is going to portray Freddie Mercury. Cannot freaking wait. Yeah, with Brian Singer directing, that's an interesting pick, but like you said, a lot of people know him from the X-Men franchise, rightfully so. Those are the biggest movies he's ever done. However, he has done smaller films like a Usual Suspects, which is on everyone's like at least top 100 list of all time and he did uh valkyrie which is i think is very underrated i actually really enjoyed that and i um i'm a sucker for like world war ii and like holocaust movies so if you can i don't even care what it's <coughs> about you put that shit in there i'm ready to go fam so um yeah valkyrie is very good so with him directing that uh and directing rami malik i think it could uh turn out so uh, to be something special so yeah i'm excited for it I'm excited to see that first trailer, or at least held even the first image of uh, Rami as uh, Freddy. Um, Speaking of images, the next piece of news. Holy shit, guys. Listen, I've said this for years. One of the most versatile actors in Hollywood is Gary Oldman. Without a doubt. The guy has played uh, villains. He's played good guys. Villains being uh, the douche cop in Leon the Professional or a good guy in Harry Potter movies or Commissioner Gordon or, uh, uh, oh shit, uh, Brian, was he, was he Dracula and Bram Stoker's Dracula too? I have no idea. Okay, I think he was. Anyways, he's very versatile. He can play anything. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the picture that's probably going to get him his very first Oscar. So he's going to be playing Winston Churchill, who was the uh, prime minister uh, uh, during a uh, – oh, shit, I'm blanking. It's World War Two, right, Brian? I think. I, you know, look, this is one I would call my mom. She's a high school history teacher, so this is one I would call her, but I'm okay. so uh, Yeah, well, like I said, guys, you're going to have to bear with me. I Like I said, I, I did a lot of drinking last night. Um, Yeah, anyways, he's a very well-known prime minister and whatnot. But that photo, when that thing leaked on the internet, he looks just like Winston Churchill. 
it, it's a side shot, so you don't really get to see like the front of his face. But the way he was posing, the way he held the cigar, and just the way the makeup looked and how it blended it so well with his face, it looks spectacular. And if he can deliver, you know, a, a really great performance in that movie, even if the movie is not that good, he, he'll probably get an Oscar nom- nomination regardless. And uh, this picture reminds me of when Daniel Day Lewis's uh, Lincoln photo. Uh, kind of unveiled, and we got to see him in his side shot. I guess that's the 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 go to shot is the the side profile. But um, I, I think uh, just from a picture, I think this is going to really uh, be uh, a great film, just by the uh, uh, nice blending of the makeup because that shit's hard to do, folks. You can't just like slap makeup on someone or prosthetics and like you know put them in front of the camera and go. No, no, it's got to be uh, very precise. Uh, very particular in how you construct it on the face and whatnot, and I think it looks really well blended in with his face, and it looks like, just from a photo, that this is going to be an Oscar-worthy performance. So, Brian, what say you? What, uh, what, is, uh, what does Gary Oldman mean to you, and what did you think of this picture? Oh, my God. I mean, well, Gary Oldman is a pretty overlooked actor, in my opinion. I think he's fantastic. I mean... He's not really one that gets a lot of award and recognition like he should. I mean, he was nominated for Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. Not a great movie, in my opinion, but awesome performance. Um, I mean, I loved him as Sirius Black and Harry Potter and Commissioner Gordon in the Dark Knight trilogy and other films that he's been in. But, like, this photo, first of all, I had no idea that he was even playing Winston Churchill. Um, second of all, I thought this was just a picture of Winston Churchill. Gary Oldman's not fat. He's never been fat. I mean, I I don't know if he has, but, like, he looks like, even though it's just makeup, it looks like he gained weight, his face is all chubby, and it's drew all the way down. It's, like, it looks great. The makeup looks amazing. It kind of has essence of, like, you know, like you said, like, some makeup in certain films, and, like, Daniel Day-Lewis, even though I don't think that was makeup, I think he actually grew a beard just like that. Like, he worked on growing the beard just like that. Um... But it looks great. The image looks awesome. I'm curious to see this movie. I'm wondering who else is in it because I remember reading it. And I'm like, oh, I like pretty much all these people. But Gary Oldman playing Winston Churchill, I learned about the guy in high school. I'm sure everyone did. But, like, um, it looks he looks just like him. I cannot wait till we get the first clip of him and just to hear how he talks as Winston Churchill because I think he's going to do a fantastic job just by the makeup alone, even if the film's not great we could probably see a best makeup win for this film already. Makeup looks fantastic. Really love this image. Yeah, for sure. It, it, when I saw that photo, I kind of just sat back and I was like, Gary Oldman, you're finally going to probably get your win. And it, uh, we had no doubt that he was never not going to win. Like the guy is so talented. He was going to win one definitely in our lifetime at some point. So uh, the fact that this photo comes out kind of just reassures the fact that he'll probably get it sooner than we thought. So, and the last piece of news, guys, this is, um, I want to get Brian's take on it because I'm so sick and tired of, uh, you know, like Collider and Screen Junkies, like, uh, kissing ass and whatnot. I want the real truth about this story. Okay. So American Werewolf in London is regarded as one of the best horror films, uh, out there. It is uh it was revolutionary in its practical uh effects. Um I love that transformation scene is one of the most iconic scenes of uh horror of w- when the main character finally transforms into the werewolf. It is disturbing and very uh, uh just god just ugh, gives you chills around your body. Um so anyways, American Wolf in London. Very good film. It is going to be remade. And it's going to be re- remade by none other the Max Landis. Now, if you don't know who he is, he's the writer of such films as Chronicle, he did Mr. Right, and uh, American Ultra, uh, I believe that's it so far. He's got several movies in the pipeline, and those are the three that have come out. Now, the original director of American Wall from London is John Landis, who is his father. Now, a lot of people who are friends with Max Landis are generally okay with this idea. Some of them even like it. But I'm sorry. (sighs) Okay, two things. First of all, we don't know how Max is going to direct. 
apparently he has directed like some small ass film that no one saw, but he claims is a masterpiece. It's great, it's fantastic, but no one has seen it. So you're giving him a humongous kind of property to direct while his dad's going to produce it. And the second thing, I got to bring up the N word. You know what's coming. Nepotism. I just, I'm sure Max will probably do a decent to good job. But I just, for something like this and trying to remake something as classic as this, wouldn't you want to get a more seasoned director or hell, someone who's even attempted at doing a medium sized budget film? Like, you don't even have to do a big budget film, but at least do like a medium sized budget. The guy's only done like an indie. So, I, I, I don't know. On one hand, it's interesting that they're going to remake it, but I also am very worried about them using uh, too much CGI in place of practical effects because that's what made the original one such uh, like a special film. So, Brian, I want to get your take on it. Do you think... <sighs> is nepotism swaying your viewpoint on this, or do you think this is a good idea, and do you think they should even remake this? nepotism is totally in the way of this this is really just not right in my personal opinion and i'm going to be completely honest i think this is a horrible idea let the original stand on its own and look chase knows this and for those listening i'm not a big horror fan i'm not a big horror fan like chases or a few of my friends are i will say that i've gotten into horror more lately because this year has been a pretty damn good year for horror films and um an american werewolf in london would is probably one of my favorite horror films ever made like i mean john landis i love john landis a lot i mean he's directed some of the best comedies from the 70s and 80s including animal house and the blues brothers and beverly hills cop oh he directed beverly hills cop 3 e train places he made uh he directed the music video for thriller i mean the guy's an amazing filmmaker he's one of the best comedy filmmakers we ever had even though thriller is not a comedy that's just a music video but regardless it's it's a funny film. It's engaging. It's scary. I don't. I just don't think Matt Landis could handle it. Now, look, that doesn't mean I don't like this guy. I mean, I really like Chronicle. I'm one of the few people on earth who liked American Ultra. I haven't seen Mr. Right. I'm excited for that film Bright he's doing with David Ayer, where Will Smith is a cop and then his cop partner is Joel Edgerton, who's an orc. By the way, they released set photos of that the other day. The makeup on Joel Edgerton looks fucking incredible. Looks so good. But... I don't like the idea of this. I just don't really want a remake of this film. Like, And if they wanted to do it, I think they should pick someone who has experience directing it. Now, that doesn't mean that Max Landis can't direct. It's just I don't like the idea of this guy helmet something that his father helmed. I just don't like it personally. Get like – I don't know. Um, get literally like a, anyone else. <laughs> if, literally anyone else. Get like – I don't know. Uh, Robert Eggers, the guy who made The Witch or – Fetty Alvarez, the guy who made Don't Breathe and Evil Dead, um, Mike Flanagan. I'm listening basically directors who directed films this year. Even though I personally wouldn't want this guy to direct it because, you know, he's doing other things, I wouldn't mind James Wan directing it, although I don't think he would direct a horror comedy type of film. I, I could be wrong, but, I mean, I don't know. You just get someone else, and really, just the idea of this, even if they get someone good, I still am not a fan of this idea personally. I'm just maybe I'm just letting the fandom of the original film get in the way, but it's the truth. I don't want anyone to ruin this property. That's why I'm just uh, against horror remakes. Yeah, well, and a couple things that you brought up. Fede Alvarez is a good pick. If you watch the 2013 remake of Evil Dead, it's a great blend of dark comedic moments, gory moments, and great practical effects. I think that would actually fit very well into. Uh, that type of werewolf universe. And second thing, a lot of people are bringing up uh, the fact that Max Landis wrote Victor Frankenstein. Oh, but, God, I forgot he wrote that too. Which uh, yeah. a lot of people will use that as their argument and be like, well, he's kind of dabbled in like that gothic horror before. But uh, I don't know. Did you see Victor Frankenstein? Because I didn't. N- not yet. Okay. Not yet. Yeah, it just didn't look good. So, uh, so yeah, I'm kind of like iffy on this. But, uh, yeah, I just... I'm not a fan of nepotism at all, like, to be frank with you. Um, I guess we'll just have to see it. But, yeah, I, I really wish they got, would have got someone way more uh, experienced. And I think um, 
Um, a Fede Alvarez is a perfect pick. So uh, I don't know who's making this. If Sony's making this, you get Fede on the fucking phone because you have worked with him in the past with Don't Breathe and uh, Evil Dead. So get his ass on the line, son. Um, yeah, so that's it for the news, guys. Uh, uh, perfect timing at the 20 minute mark. Um, so what was your favorite news story? Comment the place where my face and let me know. And, uh, you know, uh, Brian brought up uh, Will Smith uh, earlier for Bright. Speaking of Will Smith, going into the trailers, uh, the very first trailer I want uh, I want us to talk about is uh, the Collateral Beauty trailer two. Now I talked about the first trailer uh, a while back. Now in the first trailer, I really didn't know what the movie was about, and I really didn't know the tone of it. It was just kind of like very basic, very thin. It, it didn't really explain much, which I guess is what a teaser should do. This is more like the the first like full trailer. I kind of dig it. I, I kind of like the idea, like, this guy who's, like, a recluse, Will Smith plays him, and he basically writes letters to um, things or emotions like love and death and uh, whatnot, and they actually come and visit him. It, it's kind of, I don't know, it kind of reminds me of, like, a like a Christmas carol almost where, you know, uh, Scrooge uh, visits uh, past, present, and future. Um, so, uh, self and whatnot. So I don't know. I thought the emotion was really good throughout the trailer. I thought the performances looked pretty good. I don't think it's going to win the Oscars per se, but it looks like a nice little family film uh, during the Christmas holidays. So yeah, I'm totally on board now that I know what the story is about and stuff. And uh, I think it's a, like I said, it's got like a very Christmas carol-y vibe going on. So Brian, w- what say you? What did you think of the second trailer to this? I personally loved it. I'm actually really stoked for this film, and I'm not going to lie. I've been stoked since I heard about this film earlier this year. Um, I mean, for me, like, yeah, the story does seem very fascinating with him writing letters to love, death, and the other one, I believe, was Time. I think that was the other one. And um, I remember because I saw this chair yesterday before Arrival. Um, I mean, it looks like it's going to tug your heartstrings for sure. It looks like it's going to be a... A nice story for the entire family. I can totally understand why it's coming out around Christmas. Um, I just, I mean, this cast, this cast, dude, it's like, I mean, you got so many actors. I mean, yeah, Will Smith headlined the film. I mean, you got Edward Norton, Kira Knightley, Kate Winslet, Michael Pena, Naomi Harris, Helen Mirren. I mean, this cast is awesome. And I mean, first of all, and I said this, I remember when I was talking to my friends when the first trailer came out a few months ago, I'm like, Edward Norton's playing the good guy. We haven't seen that in quite some time because Edward Norton's more known for playing, you know, anti-heroes, all that stuff. Sure, he's played good guys before, but he's never played, like, this down-to-earth guy, I don't think, ever. And um, I, I'm excited to see the movie. I cannot wait. I mean, it's good counter-program because it comes out with um, Rogue One and La La Land and The Founder and this um, and that – shitty Asa Butterfield space movie comes out, so I mean... Um, Brian's I f- hate for Asa Butterfield is pretty magnificent. He is so fucking emo. I'm sorry. He is the <laughs> most emo actor in Hollywood. I'm sorry. I don't want to hate him, but I'm sorry. But anyway, good counter programming, very good trailer. Cannot wait for this movie. Yeah, it, it looked like, listen, it could, does it have the chance for Oscars? Sure. Um, but I think uh, just overall, like what Brian says, can be nice kind of programming and be. It's probably gonna be a very like nice little family film you can take your whole family to and whatnot. So, yeah, that's it for that trailer. Uh, second trailer because the the last two trailers are gonna be they're gonna be talked about a lot since they both look the same. Um, the second trailer is uh, Solus, which uh, um, stars Anthony Hopkins, Colin Farrell. And I believe Jeffrey D. Morgan, and it's it's a nice little detective crime movie. You know what's really interesting about this trailer is that it's being distributed by Lionsgate, and they've been kind of like just pumping out like these kind of TV made movies. And I don't know if like that's what they're going for, but Brian, do you remember that uh, the Keanu Reeves one, uh, the the whole truth or whatever? Or that yeah, lawyer movie like that's yes. from Lionsgate, and it kind of had that same vibe where it felt like a TV movie. But I guess if, like, you're into, like, those, like, police crime movies and stuff, and it's going to be probably very basic and very, I don't know, just very simple. Um, it doesn't look like it's going to offer anything new. It looks fine. But I, I'm just really fascinated by these movies that Lionsgate is pumping out because they're getting all these great actors. Anthony fucking Hopkins is in this, and so is Colin Farrell. What? I just don't understand. Like, are they are they hurting, hurting for some money? Or, like, what's the deal? So... Uh, listen, I'm not a huge fan of this trailer, but 
if you are into like uh, like I said, crime movies or police movies, I think you might enjoy it. It just looks like a very very matinee movie. If you're ever bored and you want to uh, go see uh, go see it in the theaters or wherever, but yeah, there's really nothing more to say. Uh, Brian, what did you think of it? I thought this shirt was really horrible. Yeah, I mean, it's. it's you know, I, I I thought I think this movie looks horrendous. I think I think I don't think this film looks any good. Look, I love the actors in it. Sure, I understand where you're coming from from when you're saying about Lionsgate and everything, but it's sad to see all these really caliber actors in this movie. Like Anthony Hopkins is one of the greatest of all time. Westworld, uh, Westworld. Still haven't watched it. Because so of fucking college. good. You, you, if, if anyone college, listening, sorry. Westworld is fucking dope, and Anthony Hopkins and Tandy Newton are gonna get Emmys. College, I'm sorry. That's like the only show that's like currently on that I cannot fucking watch. And um, our good mutual friend Ashley Cooper, the Cinema Twins, hates me for not watching it. She's like, oh, well, you need to drop that college shit and watch Westworld. I can't drop college, gal. I can't do that shit. Okay, uh, but anyway. there, there's your uh, – we're, we're sponsored today by not going to college. Uh, uh, don't go to college. Watch Westworld. That is the um, um, message I'm going to deliver you guys. <laughs> Yes, yes, but I, I will get on that soon. But really, like, him, Colin Farrell, I mean, Colin Farrell, currently on the radar out there. I mean, he's going to be a fantastic beast, which comes out on Friday. So fucking pumped, yo! And then Jeffrey D. Morgan, who's terrific as Negan right now on The Walking Dead. Yeesh. And um, the other one, that female, Abby Cornish, who is so gorgeous. She was in Limitless. She was in the RoboCop remake. She is gorgeous as fuck! But anyway... This movie looks so generic. It looks bland. It looks like Seven. I, re- I looked this up. Right. Originally, it was intended to be a sequel to Seven, but then they scrapped it and made it its own thing. And, um, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll pass on this one. This one looks so bad. I, I just – I feel sorry for everybody. Yeah, I'm going to be honest with you guys. This is probably the worst trailer out of the bunch. But, you know, it's going to happen. There's always going to be a worse one out of the group that uh, I, I talk about uh, uh, every weekend. So, Moving on to the third trailer, I'm excited to talk about this one because this one's getting a lot of shit, so much shit online. I gotta tell you, it's like batshit insane, good looking, fun. Um, what am I talking about? It's Valerian in a city of a thousand planets. This fucking trailer. Now listen, I I heard. A lot of people from Comic Con coming out going, "Oh my God, mind blown! That was one of the best things I've ever seen. The visuals were so beautiful and so grand and epic." When that trailer dropped, I was so excited to press play. I press play, and let me tell you, it looks great. And now, listen, a lot of people are comp- comparing it to last year's bomb, Jupiter Ascending. I get that. It looks the same. It's got the same vibe. However. Luke Besson is directing it, and it's coming from his company, Europa Corp. Now, Luke Besson, I name-dropped him earlier, Leon the Professional, one of my favorite like uh, uh, assassin movies of all time. He also did movies like The Fifth Element, which this movie has elements of The Fifth, fifth Element. I like Dane DeHaan in it. I think he uh, looks like he could be a pretty good little hero. Cara Delevingne, I want her to redeem herself after good old, uh, you know... Whatever, whatever the dance was she was doing in Suicide Squad. Um, <laughs> uh, anyways, uh, they both look great. The visuals are so good. And I'm, it, it, when we talk about the fourth and final trailer, I don't. Where are all these visuals coming from? They are getting so realistic now. It's kind of scary. Now, there's a couple shots in the trailer where like there's some alien shots that look a little too CGI, but. The city and the landscapes are so beautiful and colorful and and very creative. I was really just kind of blown away on a visual aspect. And listen, this movie might be garbage. But I can tell you that I will probably see this on the biggest screen possible because it looks like it warrants that. So, um, yeah, if you guys don't know what this movie is about, guess what? I don't know either. <laughs> Basically, uh, Dane DeHaan, Cara Delevingne is uh, – going throughout this city, Valerian, and fighting a bunch of shit, and it looks pretty cool. Um, it, it might be stupid as hell, but it looks pretty cool. So, uh, Brian, what say you? What did you think of Valerian? I I have to agree with you. It does look pretty great, and um, I'm surprised as hell by this because I'm kind of hit or miss with Luke Besson. Like, Leon the Professional and The Fifth Element, I think, are fantastic. Um, he's done other films. Like, he's produced a lot of stuff, but, like, the other two films that I know, at least that he directed, were... Remember that film Arthur and the Invisibles with Freddie Highmore? Do you remember that movie? No. <laughs> no? Good. Um, 
and then he did Lucy, which was really, in my opinion, disappointing. I was so excited for that film. I think a lot of people were. Well, and uh, you know, the, the, the weird laughed. thing with uh, Luke Besson is that he is like the master at one name movies. He's the guy behind Hannah, Columbiana, and Lucy. Like he lo- listen, and that's the one thing I really like about Luke Besson. He loves strong female characters, and I think that's very important in uh, the landscape of Hollywood. But sometimes yes. the movies that he makes or produces is very subpar, not that good. But anyways, like, he's he's really good. Yeah, at, go ahead. Yeah, he, no, I'm just saying he was really good at um, creating these strong female characters, which is fucking awesome, and uh, I really give him props for that. But for the most part, some of the stuff he creates is you know not that good. But That's uh, absolutely true. Yeah, so uh, uh, anyway, sorry to cut you off there. No, 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 that's all right. It's your show. But um, yeah, um, like you said, the visuals look incredible. They look so good. I mean, I was watching this show, and I was kind of expecting kind of shit because Lou Besson, like I said, lately just hasn't been that strong. But then when it opens up with that first shot of the spell, I'm like, ooh, that actually looks pretty fucking great. Um, I like Danny DeHaan a lot. I think he's a very talented actor. I mean, he was so good in Chronicle. I've been on his radar since then. I mean, he hasn't really been in much, which is upsetting, but I'm excited to see him do more stuff. Unfortunately, I still don't like Cara Delevingne. I want to, but I just can't. I didn't like her in Paper Towns, and for being the only person in the world who actually enjoyed Suicide Squad, I hated her in the film. Um, yeah, the dance was absolutely ridiculous. She just wasn't the right fit to play that particular character. Um, but I will say that she might win me over in this because she actually does look like she's going to add something to this movie. And, you know, a lot of kids my age love her because they think she's hot. Look, she's not ugly. I think she's I don't think hot. she's that hot, uh, personally. I'm sorry. I mean, uh, okay, here's a little secret, guys. I absolutely hated Suicide Squad, and basically she was belly dancing throughout the entire movie. Like she looked like a belly dancer you would see on the side of a street, uh, trying to get uh, you know change or whatever. I gotta tell you, I think I think she's pretty smoking. Those listen, those dark eyebrows get me every it's single the eyebrows, time. Eyebrows, just ru- the I eyebrows kind of ruin it for me. I love them. They're, they're they're fucking fantastic. I, like, I will say that she does look really attractive here. I will say that she looks m- more attractive in this than she did in Suicide Squad and the Fall in Our Stars sequel. Um, yeah, pretty much. But, um, but hey, it does look like a well-done film. It looks like it's going to be Luke Besson's best film in years. And I'm, I'm pretty excited to see it. I cannot wait for the summer. Good teaser. Nothing like – it's not like the best teaser I've ever seen. But hey – for a teaser for a film from Luke Besson, it's pretty damn good. I totally agree. And uh, let me know down below what you thought of the Valerian A City of a Thousand Planets trailer. And do you think Cara Delevingne, with her sexy cal- caterpillar eyebrows, if she's hot or not? So, I mean, t- they kill me. I love them. I love- she's, ah, she's attractive. Um, yeah, she's one of my uh, one of my new favorite hotties uh, next to Brie Larson. Anyways, um, okay, speaking of... Uh, trailers. Uh, Brian, uh, this is actually a perfect segue into your new uh, YouTube channel um, because Brian is actually not going to talk about this trailer because Brian actually has a uh, reaction channel on YouTube. Uh, Brian, would you like to uh, plug that real fast? Yes, the channel is called Preview Party. I do trailer reactions for movies, TV shows, and sometimes video games. Uh, The trailer that we're about to talk about, I haven't seen yet because I was going to film a reaction right after the show, and um, I'm excited to watch the trailer. I don't know if it's good or bad. Am I a little skeptical? Sure. But, hey, I'm pretty stoked to watch this trailer. And, um, yeah, my trailer reaction channel has been going on for a few weeks. I appreciate the people who have been watching. I'm close to, like, 70 subscribers right now. And I just started the channel, like, two weeks ago, which is awesome. So, um, yeah, uh, check it out. Chase put a link for it in the description below. It's called Preview Party. Please subscribe. And I really appreciate that. So, Chase, go ahead and talk about this particular trailer. Okay. So, speaking of Valerian Part 2... Um, Ghost in the Shell. Now, I have not seen the uh, um, uh, anime of this. I've also not read the manga comics or manga graphic novels or whatever they're called or, and whatever it comes from. Um, but I've been really fascinated by it. I've always wanted to see Akira and Ghost in the Shell. Those are my two top priorities in terms of uh, animes because I'm starting to getting into a lot more anime now. One of my favorite ones uh, I recently have seen, which was this year, was the Attack on Titan um, TV, show, 
TV show slash movie that they constructed. Um, I love that. I I love that whole, like, just, I love mythology, and I love, like, uh, these crazy eccentric ideas and characters and stuff about, while having, like, realistic themes and whatnot. For Ghost in the Shell, this trailer just dropped, like, a couple hours ago. I'm intrigued. I'll say that. Um, it is pretty much a teaser, for sure, but it's it's a two-and-a-half-minute teaser. The visuals in this, just like with Valerian, I don't know what the fuck is happening in Hollywood, but they are, like, just up in their game in terms of visual effects. Everything in this movie looked so breathtakingly beautiful. I was like, wow, they really con- they created this world that um, um, this character lives in. Uh, Scarlett Johansson uh, plays the main character. She plays an android. And, um, basically they bring her back, uh, for a specific reason. You don't know, uh, even in the trailer. That's what I'm telling you. It's very, very, very teaserish. So I thought she looks good. Uh, she kind of reminds me of her character from under the skin where she plays an alien. Um, and, uh, she kind of has like that robotic attitude and whatnot, but she's really good at, uh, that type of, uh, performance. So this should be no problem to her. The choreography looks really good. When Brian does his trailer reaction, I will bet you a hundred bucks that he says this looks exactly like dread. Like it has the feeling of a dread. Oh, now I'm excited. Now I'm excited to watch it. Listen, Brian's going to be like, it had the feeling of a dread, the choreography of a dread. That's what it kind of reminded me of. And that's what it looks like. It looks like a dread. It kind of has like that dread feel, except, um, instead of Carl Urban, uh, in a uh, uh, an awesome suit is Scarlett Johansson in a uh, very tight suit. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I'm really excited to, to see this. I'm curious about it. It gets me more pumped to actually uh, seek out the anime version. So, yeah, Ghost in the Shell, pretty good little teaser. I thought the visuals were really great. And Scarlett Johansson, always kicking ass and one of my favorites. So, And speaking of Under the Skin, if you guys have not seen that shit, you got to get on that. It is one of the best movies of uh, the 2010s, hands down. So, yeah, uh, that will do it for the trailers, guys. What was your favorite trailer that we talked about? Comment the place around my face and let me know. And uh, speaking of uh, Under the Skin and Aliens, um, the movie that we're going to be talking about, which I am really excited for, and I think Brian is too. We're, like, we're busting at the seams to talk about this because this is going to be probably one of the longest and most detailed discussions I've ever had on a movie, period. The movie that we're going to be reviewing came out this weekend. And that movie is Arrival. Now, a little backstory before we get into it, because Brian and I have a lot to talk about, and I will tell you this right now, no no spoilers, we're not going to spoil anything, uh, but we will toe that line, let's just say that. Okay, so this movie is directed by Denis Villeneuve, who has done uh, such films um, that are going to be destined to be classics. I, I I will put money on that right now. Prisoners, Enemy, Sicario, now this. He's also doing the Blade Runner sequel, so th- this guy's starting to become one of my favorites, period. I love Enemy. I love Sicario. I love Prisoner. I love everything he's done. He has never done a bad movie in my, my eyes. Fucking Arrival. Let me tell you guys this right now. I saw it yesterday. I had to think about it. And after thinking about it for 24 hours, <sighs> this is one of the best movies of the year. It is one of the smartest movies I've seen all year, and it's got one of the best screenplays. Now, like I said, we're going to do very, very cautiously in terms of like describing this, because I do not want to spoil it, because that is the whole um, kind of surprise and magic of the film, is if you go in there not knowing anything. So... Uh, we're going to do first impressions first, Brian, and then we'll break it down uh, according to the categories. So, first impression, I love this film. And it's going to be my top ten somewhere. I just don't know. And God damn it, I said this when I walked out of the theater. Because I've seen four good fucking movies in a row. I saw Manchester by the Sea. Oh my God, that was fantastic. Then Moonlight beat that. And then I'm like wanting to put Hacksaw Ridge up in the top three. Now fucking Arrival's going to do that. You, Hollywood. Calm the fuck down, because if you if you throw all these movies at me, it's going to be even harder to construct that, that fucking list, okay? Just ch- chill your shit. Okay, anyways, I love Arrival, and I think it is one of, definitely one of the smartest uh, uh, written movies of the year, hands down. So, Brian, first impression, uh, did you like it? Did you love it? Did you hate it? Did you think it was okay? 
Okay, first I'll give a little background. Um, Denis Villeneuve, I love this guy as well. Um, Prisoners, I think, was all of our first exposures to him, and he killed it with that film. Then he did Enemy, which is one love of it. my favorite films of it's a, um, the it's decade a modern so far. Hitchcock. So good. Like, you know, Chase, like, out of those weird A24 films that came out in 2014, Chase, I think, has a huger love for Under the Skin. I have a huger love for Enemy, and I can tell you that it was all thanks to Denis Villeneuve. Um, and then Sicario last year. I was on your po- I was on this show when you talked about Sicario, and we both loved it, which is great. And um, this movie, I was excited to see. Love the marketing, love the actors, love Denis Villeneuve, love the concept. You know, I've seen many good films recently too. I mean, I saw Hacksaw Ridge, loved it. Then I just saw Moonlight the other day, loved that. There's another film coming into my top ten, and it's Arrival. I fucking adored Arrival. I thought this film was fantastic. I loved it so much. Yeah, I – guys, it's one of those things where I actually don't even know where to begin. It's just that good. Um, and I was actually really surprised. Too. I don't know if Brian knows this. I was really surprised that the only reason this movie is a PG-13 is for one F-bomb that is muddled. I, I was sitting there thinking, I was like – I was like – this is a pretty clean movie, I because usually like considering the fact that I just saw Hacksaw Ridge you know, or you know last week and that's like fucking graphic as shit, and then we get to this one, it's very calm, it's very slow, and nothing's really happening, and then it's just like <laughs> he says, "Holy fuck!" And that was it. That PG thirteen guys, woohoo! All right, anyways, um, I, I I cannot be the only crazy person that didn't notice that. Anyways. Going into the movie, let's talk about the writing and directing, Brian, because I think this is where the movie shines the most. Yes. If if we start with the writing, the way the story is constructed, and this is not spoiling anything. I'm just telling you guys this up front. It is a nonlinear movie, but it actually makes sense. And the way they play the nonlinear element with the uh, um, kind of the story and the characters – and the whole purpose behind the aliens coming is genius. Like I, when the movie was done, like it, 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 it I kind of like thought about it right away. I was like, oh my god, that was like really impressive on how you told the story, even with that element. So the way the story is constructed, guys, is very unique. It's unlike anything I've ever seen, and it makes sense for the story and the characters. It's a very smart film and a very kind of different film. Um, uh, when it comes to like alien films, I'm letting you guys know this right now. It is a slow burn. There's no like shooting going on. There's no Independence Day fucking monologues and shit. This is a very quiet movie. It's a very human movie. This film actually exposes the humans more than the aliens in terms of like how we feel and what would happen uh, if something like this were to happen. Would we unify as a world or would we, would we be divided in terms of like. Uh, who's going to attack and who's going to try to communicate with them and stuff. I thought that was really smart in the questions that it was um, arising for a kind of like uh, reality standpoint. Um, I thought, it, I, uh, just like with the story, I thought the dialogue uh, itself was also really smart and how they constructed uh, this new language that the aliens had and, you know, them deciphering it and whatnot. I just thought it, it was... Just, it just felt so smart, and, and the guys that were sitting next to me, these these fucking guys, I'm pretty sure they hated the movie because they kept talking throughout the entire thing as if they didn't fucking get it, and they they were just like, "Oh man, well, where's you know where's the explosions and shit?" Nom, 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 nom. It's like, can you just enjoy the fucking movie, guy? So, um, yeah. Uh, so Brian, let's go with you to the the writing. I actually have no issues with the way. Uh, the movie is written. I think, it, like I said, it's a very smart way to tell the story. It's very emotional at its core, and it's actually more about the humans than the aliens. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Brian, what about you? What, uh, just particularly the writing and stuff, what did you think about the story? Yeah, to the echo characters? with you, I appreciate how the script was more character-driven than like action-driven and stuff. I really yeah. appreciate how like we focused so much on the characters and not really a lot on the aliens. And yes, the aliens were definitely had a very crucial amount of screen time for sure. But um, I really appreciate how we learned so much more about all three of these characters, uh, Amy Adams, Jeremy Renner, and Forrest Whitaker. Like, I appreciate how we learned more. It's particularly Amy Adams' character. But, like, um, I really just appreciate the character-driven elements of this movie. Like, that's the thing. The story is so self-contained, which is great because, I mean, even though we're not going to talk about the directing, 
if you look at the screenplays, like I, I have um I have a screenwriting class here in college every Thursday night, and um, sometimes we have to read scripts. I found this script for Prisoners and Enemy Online, and I was reading both of them, and yeah, they're both thrilling movies for sure. But the thing is, like, even though they're character driven, there's like a bunch of like thrilling sequences to them. This one, I mean, obviously I haven't read the script because it's not online, and I wouldn't do that yet. But um, I appreciate just how much dialogue there is. Like, there's not really a lot of like action. There's no action at all. There's no explosions. There's none of that stuff. Sure, there's one little tiny moment where something kind of explodes. One little moment. It's not a spoiler, but um, I just really appreciate the way the script was executed, and it's one of the best scripts of the year. I, I'm sure it will get nominated for Best Adapted Script, but because it's based on a short story called Story of My Life or Story of Your Life. It's something like that. And um, I just love I love the screenplay. Fantastic screenplay. One of the best of the year. Absolutely. Hands down. Yeah, you know what's really interesting about Denny Villeneuve is that he doesn't write his screenplays. In all the movies he do- has done, he's done from uh, other different... Or he's, he's adapted other screenwriters' material he is finding some of the best screenwriters. Like, if you think about it, Prisoners is a really great, disturbing hostage movie. Enemy is a is a brilliant, Alfred Hitchcockian type of thriller. Sicario is a great drug cartel movie. This one, I said this when I walked out of the theater, and I totally believe it. If Hitchcock were to make an alien movie, this would be it. Once again, Denis Villeneuve... I, I am fully convinced at this point that he is, one of his biggest influencers is Guy B. Hitchcock. There's no way he's not. Like, everything about this, from like what Brian said, the slow tension and the buildup with these characters and these situations, it felt so old school. It felt like an old school type of like 50s or 60s type of alien little suspenseful thriller. So It, it had like essence of like close encounters of the third yes, kind. Yes, absolutely. So, yeah, the writing for sure. That's gonna get nominated for best original screenplay, or I guess it's adapted. Yeah, because it's adapted yeah adapted. A work. Um. Anyways, going to the directing. What Denis Villeneuve once again does proves to us that he is a master filmmaker when creating tension in scenes that have no action and is all dialogue based is one of the most impressive things you can do as a director. Going to a Quentin Tarantino, for instance. The guy is so dialogue heavy. However, the way he writes his characters and the way the dialogue is is spouted out makes the direction easier for the film, creating these tension-filled scenes or creating beautiful melodic scenes that flow together and, and don't feel like they're jumping and it feels like one cohesive piece. This is just that. We don't know why the aliens are here. And the whole time you are wondering what the hell is going to happen. And all the way, like the movie opens up, and I believe this is probably the the strongest opening that Denny has probably ever had. It is a very emotional beginning. It starts out with a punch, and as soon as I saw that Huge opening, punch. I was like, "Denny's gonna fucking take us on a ride," and I'm totally down for this. So, the way the movie starts and the way the movie ends, bookended on another emotionally like kind of powerful ending. Once again, just shows you the confidence that this director has in telling a good story without hardly using any CGI, by the way. I mean, yes, there's CGI, but it's it's used and blended in so well that he really focuses on the characters and the story. And that's what Denny does here. It's emotional. It felt old school. I love the tension between every single scene. Because you had no idea what was going to happen. When Amy Adams is up there communicating with those aliens, you have no, you don't know if the aliens are going to re- retaliate and fucking blow her head off, or you don't know if they're going to like try to uh, peacefully talk to her and stuff. It's great stuff. And the, the reveal, the ending of this film, it's one of the best climaxes of the year. Because... I had no idea where the movie was going to go, but once it like started to reveal everything and really kind of t- take a hold of the story and really kind of build you up to this point, I think what Denny did very well is just, it's just a nice crescendo, and that's the base, best way to describe it. It starts out at the bottom, and you're interested, you're hooked with that emotional uh, beginning, and it ramps up into this really great kind of gut-punching ending, and it kind of makes you think and go, 
wow, I can actually see this happening, to be honest with you, in terms of uh, if aliens were to come down and whatnot uh, as a situation that might happen. So, yeah, in terms of the directing, very old school, very Hitchcockian, loved the the tension built throughout, loved all the emotional scenes. So, Brian, what say you? Uh, what did you think about Denny's directing, and do you think this is one of his better ones? And, uh, yeah, just tell me all about that. See, here's the thing with me and his direction for this particular film. I mean, first of all, I have the disclosures right now. He will be nominated for Best Director for this film. He's going to get a Best Director nomination. If not, then I don't know what the fuck's going to happen. Um, you know, it's hard for me to describe what his best directed film is because all four of the films that we just talked about, including this one, are so well directed, and I guarantee that Blade Runner 2 is going to be well directed too. But this one, I mean, like I said before when I brought up the writing, this is easily Denis Villeneuve's most self-contained film ever. This is his most subtle film that he's ever done because all three of those other films are too like gut punching and they, like you never take a breather. This one is calm. It's subdued. Sure, you're on the edge of your seat. Sure, you might be like <sighs> like heavy panting, especially when you first see the aliens. When Amy Adams and Jeremy Renner and Forrest Whitaker go up there and talk to them. But it's just great. Like, yeah, you brought the opening. I mean, this film opened up so heartbreaking. I knew that we were going to go on it, quite an adventure. It was going to be quite the journey we were going to go on, especially with, um, um, hold on, to try, Louise, Louise Banks, who's Amy Adams' character. And, um, I, I, you, you know, I, I don't know if I agree with this, but I have to think about it. But as of right now, I think this might be the best directed. Like, in terms of films, this might be the best he's directed. It's not my favorite film that he's done, but in terms of direction, this might be the best one because it's so different from the three films that he's done before. And I had not seen that um, foreign film he did in Sendies, which everyone says is fantastic, but um, I love the direction. It's so good. And, yes, the ending, I'll, I'll say this right now. At first, I was mixed on the ending. But then I, I thought about it over a few hours, and I, I saw the film yesterday as well. I love the way it ended. I appreciate the way it ended. Sure, it may not – sure, it's not understandable. Sure, you have to think about it. You might have to go see this movie again just for everything, but especially for the ending. And I just love it. I think this is a fantastic directed film. Denis Villeneuve, once again – crushes it he really is a master filmmaker to quote you and yeah just well, blown away by the direction yeah and with the direction guys uh the number one job of a director is to get the best performances out of the actors and going into the acting now yes this is this is one of the the best amy adams movies i've ever seen period yes. it's one of the best performances she's, she's ever given she's very vulnerable she's very smart she's very confident um, she is scared. She pretty much embodies what a normal human should act like. It's because of the way she is written. She uh, she has all these full range of emotions and whatnot, and um, she just wants answers and she's trying to help out and uh, kind of like the the way I felt uh, with the Martian last year in terms of optimism. I felt like her character was very optimistic and she was very. Uh, uplifting because in the film she goes against what everyone else does but yet you know deep down that she's probably the most right and the way she handles it she handles it with such gravitas and such confidence that you root for her and then when you get to those emotional scenes you care about her and then you, you become invested and that's what's great about her performance it is so wide range in this film but it works for her character, who is a linguist. She's very good at languages and uh, deciphering uh, uh, languages and whatnot. And um, that's kind of a cool premise if you think about it for an alien film. So uh, I thought she did very well. Forrest Whitaker, he's good. He's fine. He's serviceable. But I got to be honest with you guys, one of my only nitpicks about the film is Jeremy Renner. I like the guy, but it's like... Okay, he's there. Uh, it doesn't really add anything to the movie, in my opinion. He's very important. Don't get me wrong. He's very important to the movie. But his performance doesn't really add anything, considering the fact that Amy Adams fucking outperformed both of those guys. So, uh, and yeah, the rest of the cast is fine. Um, they're just kind of background noise, to be to be honest with you. But those are the three, three that you look out for. 
definitely one of the best Amy Adams performances, and I cannot wait for Nocturnal Animals now because she might have a double header uh, at the Oscars, which would be fucking fantastic. So, Brian, what say you about the acting? Did you think Amy Adams was the standout? What did you think about Jeremy Renner and just the acting overall? What kind of question is that? Of course, Amy Adams was the standout. I mean, I, what, I, I don't know. We, some what, people, what, some people might say the the fucking alien testicles were the, <laughs> the standout. Well, I mean, they they were the stands out too, but um, <laughs> no. Uh, when we did our top five show the other day, I said that Amy Adams is just one of those actresses that's just getting better. That project after project after project, this is one of her best performances she's ever given. Hell, it might. I might be going on by saying this. This might be the best performance she's ever given in her whole career. I think she, first of all, she's going to get nominated for Best Actress for this. She has to get nominated for this film. Now, look, I haven't seen Nocturnal Animals. I'm excited for that film. I'm really excited for that film. But I think in terms of performances, I think this is the one that she has a stronger chance of getting nominated for because this is kind of the more Oscar-type performance. Nothing against Nocturnal Animals. Like I said, haven't seen the film yet. Heard it's fantastic. Heard she's fantastic, but... You know, I think this is the one where she might get strong recognition. Her character was so good. Like I said, Louise Banks is now one of my favorite characters of the whole year. Like like you said, Chase, she's optimistic. She's smart. She's sweet. She's scared. I mean, I love this character. And the thing is with Denis Villeneuve, what I loved about Emily Blunt's character in Sicario was that, like, oh, she's such a badass. But she was really scared of the situations that she was getting into, particularly with Benicio Del Toro's character. And with this one, Amy Adams, you think, oh, she's confident in everything. She's scared. She's not as confident as everyone thinks she is because there are some sequences where she thinks everything's going to go well, and yet it doesn't. And it's really beautiful. It's a great performance. I really loved her in this movie. I don't think anyone else could have played the role as well as her. Anyone could have played this role, but Amy Adams killed it. To quote you on Forrest Whitaker, I think the guy's a terrific actor. He didn't really have much to do in this movie, for the, but for the time that he was on screen, he was good. And Jeremy Renner, I can understand where everyone, where people are going by saying, oh, he was just okay, his character, yes, was important, but his performance was whatever. I liked his performance personally. I don't think he was incredible or anything. I thought, first of all, I thought he and Amy Adams worked together very, very well. I thought they had great chemistry. And, um, but yeah, his character, eh, his performance was fine, but it was still a quite good performance. Everyone was good. There was not one weak performance in this film, which Nivelle Noob knows. He never gets any weak performances from any of his actors, which is always a delight. So, yeah, acting, pretty good. Amy Adams, hopefully you get that Oscar nomination. Well, here, here's the deal about Jeremy Renner is that Amy Adams is so well-rounded, and she has so many emotions and characteristics about her character Jeremy Renner, he felt a little one-dimensional a little bit. I understand. I like, understand. He, he, like, compared to her, he was almost very flat. And like I, like I was saying, he is very important to the story. Do not get me wrong. But in terms of performance and character itself and just the way it is uh, rounded by his performance, I didn't feel it as much as I felt for Amy. So, uh, yeah. But anyways, that, that's my – honestly, my only qualm about the movie is Jeremy Renner. Um, but that doesn't deter my my love for the film. Um, cinematography. Oh, yes. Holy shit. Okay, let me tell you guys this. A masterful cinematographer can take a claustrophobic situation and still make it beautiful in a fork. Uh, euphoric. Let me explain. Every single shot involving the alien pod is beautiful. The opening shot of when they discover the pod and they're getting close to it and you see the the fog from the clouds just kind of like rise throughout the middle of the pod and you see the pod in the background the way it's framed up it's just so beautiful and it's just, guys when they get into the pod itself it's just it's just breathtaking to watch some of the camera like angles and movements that they use are very uh excuse me uh disoriented and very um uh, frightening and claustrophobic, like I said, but also have like this sense of um, wonderment and kind of awe because these are people discovering aliens for the first time. So when you're in this pod, these fucking people are like, you know, looking at him and whatnot. So um, it, it kind of has, like I said, that that kind of awe and, and inspiring stuff in it. But the way it's filmed, I don't know if that. that I'm assuming it was a set. Whoever did that fucking set, good job. It, it looked really cool. It looked like a fucking cave. It was so cool uh, to see um, how it was designed. And it was it was very basic. It was just a square. It was a square with one color, but like I said, it felt 
It felt real, and that's the important thing. I, In the back of my mind, and Brian knows this too, when you're watching a movie, you, you know it's a set. But I believed every single moment of the movie, so I was like, oh my god, they're actually in an alien pod right now. That's what I was thinking. I was like, just the way the, the camera kind of moved very flowingly throughout the entire pod, and the way it was um, um, kind of placed with Amy's character and the aliens and whatnot, I thought that was really well done. Even um, the outside kind of like field scenes, because that's where the alien pod's at, I thought those were really well done. Like, I love all the shots in the film where like Amy's, Amy's character is like contemplating something or thinking about something, and you see the alien pod in the background like out of focus. It's just... I don't know. It just it felt real. It, I, I was grounded in that realism from the way it was shot. It was very beautiful, very kind of dreamlike in some, uh, uh, you know, uh, some scenes. I love the color palette. It was just very um, kind of cold in some uh, scenes, very uh, warm in other scenes with the uh, the bright glowing colors versus the uh, kind of grim blue and green colors. So yeah, I thought the cinematography was very gorgeous. Love the opening shot of when they discover the pod and everything inside the pod is just um, really well done in terms of capturing the claustrophobia and the magic of discovering aliens. So, uh, Brian, what say you? Uh, what about the cinematography um, uh, kind of struck you the most? Well, I mean, I think every shot in this film was beautiful. Um, yes, I will echo you by saying that the first wide shot you see of the um, – so good the pod i mean beautiful great shot one of the best shots like if you guys follow if you guys are on twitter which i believe everyone is including myself and chase um there's this twitter page called one perfect shot yes. where they particularly take a shot from any film even if it's the shittiest film ever they take a shot that is so gorgeous looking it's like it's so perfect i guarantee you that that particular shot from arrival will be on that twitter page within the next few months i will guarantee you that that shot will be on that page, I guarantee it. But all the other shots were great. I will echo you on the set. That set, when they were inside the pod, was fucking astounding. It was so good. And I think this film also has a strong chance of getting a production design nomination, too. I mean, this film, I think, will get a lot of technical awards, for sure. Cinematography, definitely. It's not Roger Deakins who shot this, which is sad. But the guy who shot this did a pretty good job. I think this guy's going to be shooting the Han Solo movie. I remember reading some articles saying that he was going to shoot that movie. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I'm... I love the way this film looked. Lots of great long takes and everything. So, yeah, um, cinematography, great. Yeah, you know what's really cool about the Alien Pod? I forgot to mention this. The depth of field is really Absolutely. well handled. Because when they enter the pod, it's a vertical thing. It's like a it's like a bean almost. So they enter from the bottom and they go to the top, right? And so yeah. w- when they're at the top and the, the camera is um, you know on Amy's face or whatever and you see in the background the bottom of the pod, it's some really brilliant use of uh, depth of field and I like I said I couldn't fucking tell what was practical and what was CGI well obviously the aliens were CGI let's get that out of the way however um, in terms of the way the pod looked and the depth of field it was using I honestly couldn't tell where the green screen was like it was just blended in so well and it just it worked with the cinematography um, so yeah moving on into the uh, final uh, portion of the review is the editing and uh We'll do special effects and music uh, as well because the music, holy shit, is very important. Um, Editing-wise, the movie's about two hours long, and I will tell people this. It is a slow burn. It is not fast-paced, but I think with the emotional investment that you will have with the characters in the story will make the movie worthwhile, and that two hours will seem very, very fast to you. If you are not into those type of movies, I will warn you right now, this is not your movie. Um, But if you like kind of like the a movie that makes you think a little bit and it kind of takes its time like breathing out on the scenes and whatnot i think it's uh i think it's paced out very kind of beautifully it's like it's almost like a sheet of music it's very just very melodic and just very it's flowing and it just it has a nice um uh, cadence to it so i I would consider it like like to a piece of music um a really great like orchestra uh special effects once again i think the pod itself looks great the aliens are very CGI. However, they do cloak the aliens in fog for the most part, so you honestly can't tell. So I think that was Denny's way of like hiding the special effects just a little bit so you get more invested in the story and not be taken out as much, which I think is a very smart move director-wise. I don't know if that was the case. Make I'm just pointing something out. I, I don't even know if it's true. Um, so special effects are very well blended in with the scenes. 
the music. I was listening to it, and I couldn't tell where it was from. Maybe Brian can has the answer, but it reminded me of uh, another movie. It was, it's not like a Black Swan, but it was like something like that, where like it sounded similar, and I was like, oh my god, like what is this? Like, uh, anyways, the music that they use throughout the movie, it starts out with the bang with the opening scene. It is so powerful and it is so sweeping. It locks you in from the moment that you hear it. And that was Denny's purpose for that music is to lock you in immediately. And then at the end, when the music is used again, it keeps you locked in uh, until the very finale of the film. I thought the music w- fit very, very well. Once again, felt very classical, very old school. So, um, yeah, that's my thoughts on the uh, editing, special effects, and music. Brian, what say you? Do you think the slow burn, um, do you think it works for this film? Did you think the music was appropriate for the film? And what did you think of the blended special effects? I mean, for a film like this, it really cannot be fast-paced. I mean, for a film like this to be fast-paced, it just wouldn't feel right. I mean, it would feel great, too, but it wouldn't just – it wouldn't work out, in my opinion. The slow burn really adds something to it because, like I said, like you and I said, this is a character-driven film. And most character-driven films are known for having the slow burn to it. And usually I'm hit or miss with slow burn films. I will tell you that this one worked very well for what it was going for. Um, visually, I mean, for what they tried to do and for the budget that they had, the visuals were not all that bad. They weren't bad by any means. I mean, I will agree that the, fa- the fact that they kind of let the fog block off the aliens, I think that was a clever thing. I mean, it could have been practical, but it, it definitely looked like it was CGI. The music is incredible. I mean, this is scored by Yo- um, this is composed by Johan Johansson, who did the mm. score for Sicario. Yes. Now, when I saw Sicario, um, full disclosure, I kind of got ill during the movie, and um, because that was a crazy day for me, because I saw The Walk that morning in IMAX 3D, so that was probably not the smartest double feature for me. But um, when I rewatched the movie a few months ago, I was listening to the score because the thing is, when I saw the movie, I wasn't really paying attention to the score. Score in that movie is fantastic. The score in this is incredible, too. I will see Johan Johansson probably getting the best original score nomination for this. I mean, the score is yeah. so scary. It's thrilling. It's quiet. It's subdued. It's great. It's fantastic. It's emotional. I love it so much. I mean, I really, in terms of technicality, like the edit, the visuals, music, cinematography, everything technical about this movie is great. And even the sets, it's great. So, yeah, music visuals and editing very well executed yeah and you bring up a good point about the music that i completely forgot the music itself just like with the characters has a full range of emotions the music is haunting at some times it is eerie it is creepy but also very inspiring very emotional sweeping the that's a great point the music is is very wide range in emotions but it plays out with the scenes very well just kind of adding another layer to the greatness. So overall, guys, my overall thoughts, very smart, slow burn, alien, suspenseful thriller, beautiful direction and cinematography. The music is fantastic. And uh, I, I think this will be on most people's top 10 of the year. It is a, um, when you watch it, think about it. Like go home, take a nap, uh, watch a porno. I, I don't know what you guys do on the weekends. Anyways, when you when you sit down and you think about it for a while and you start to like fully grasp the intelligence that this movie is kind of brewing it's almost quite magical to know that you witnessed something like that that's the type of experience that i had for arrival jeremy renner and forrest whitaker probably my only nitpicks of the film um and it will be my top 10 so hollywood slow down on your shit because all next week, I have so many movies lined up to where they could all easily be in my top 10. And I will be pissed if they are all fantastic because I'm going to have to fucking rearrange around everything. But uh, I guess that's uh, the coolest thing I'm making a top 10 list. But Arrival will definitely be on there. Beautiful, fantastic alien film. Um, and I will give my grade as soon as Brian is done with his overall thoughts. Yeah, overall, uh, Denis Villeneuve once again crafted a incredible, genius film i think this is one of the best films of the year for sure uh in terms of direction like i said i think this is the best directed film he's done in terms of directing 
and before we give our grades, we should probably rank these four films, like the four films he's done, just to know sure. what our favorite is and what our least favorite is. Um, but yeah, the performances were fantastic, particularly Amy Adams. The visuals were really good. The score was haunting. The writing was excellent. I love this film so much, and I cannot wait to hopefully check it out again because I might, I might consider going to check this movie out again if I have the time to go check it out again because I really, really want to go see it again. And when I, after I saw the movie, I called my parents. They're going to see it today. I think only my mom is because you know it's Sunday. It's my dad's favorite time of the week. It's football day, boys. And of um, so I mean, you know, he'll pro- he might. He might have seen it. I don't know. I don't think he'll like it. My mom will hopefully love it. But, hey, anyways, Arrival, awesome film. Just great, great movie. Yeah, and uh, just to cap that off, guys, I'm going to give my grade of Arrival a solid A. So, Brian, what about you? Where where does it rank for you? I'm going to have to echo with you and also give it a solid A. So now with the Villeneuve films, I will – Prisoners is still my favorite thing he's done. And then I would say then Sicario – then this, and then Enemy. While Enemy, I adored the shit out of, I think in terms of his best, I still think Prisoners might be the best thing he's ever done. And Sicario is probably, like, not the worst, uh, not Sicario, Enemy. Enemy is amazing. It's just that that's the one where everyone might not rewatch it again. I mean, they'll have to because it's the most confusing thing in the entire world. But, um, you know, um, yeah, uh, Prisoners is my favorite thing he's done. And then Sicario, and then this, and then Enemy. I'm actually going to go opposite. Um, I actually like his smaller, self-contained Hitchcockian films more. So I will do Enemy as my favorite, Arrival as my second favorite, then I would go Sicario, and Prisoners as fourth. Now, I love Prisoners. So all you people out there, they're just like, oh my god, you fucking hate it. No, I fucking own it. I love that yeah, shit. Uh, listen, listen, people. We just said that all four of these films are fantastic. We love all it's four hard, of them. It's hard. It's fucking hard to pick one, but... Um, in terms of like what Brian said, when I saw Enemy, I was very confused. However, <laughs> I knew what I saw was uh, something special, and I wanted to research it more. And when I watched it a second time, I grasped everything, and I just I felt smarter for finally getting it and whatnot. But all you guys are way smarter than me. You'll probably get on the first try. But um, I, I love I love the the Hitchcockian ones more. Uh, so that's why Arrival and Enemy are my favorite. Totally um, understandable. Yeah. So what about you guys? What did you think of Arrival? Is it going to be in your top ten of the year? Uh, did you like it? Did you love it? Did you hate it? All that stuff. Comment the place from my face and let me know. And what is your favorite Denny Villeneuve film that he's done so far? Um, all right. So that will bring it to the uh, last portion of the show. Uh, oh, Brian, God. It feels Brian great kno- to do this yeah, again. Brian knows the fucking rules. Uh, box office results for the weekend, guys. Uh, the movies that came out this weekend were Arrival and Almost Christmas and Shut In. So those are the hint, those are the movies that we'll give Brian, uh, and Brian's uh, goal is to guess the top five, and then afterwards, uh, after when he gets them wrong, I will uh, reveal <laughs> uh, said list. So Brian, uh, what are the top five of the weekend? First of all, it's exciting to do this again because when I did nerdy scores, my co-host Matt would be the one guessing the box office results, and I would tell him them. So it's great to finally do this again. Um, okay, so first of all, shutting. There's no way that film made the top five. No way in hell that film made the top five. Okay, so number five, I'm going to go with Almost Christmas. Four, Hacksaw Ridge. Three, Trolls. Two, Arrival. And one, Doctor Strange. I probably did so bad. See, I haven't done this in over a year, guys. But, you know, it was fun trying. So Wow. Uh, Brian got one right. And I knew it. He switched everything else. So okay, so I, I knew that all five of these films would be on the top five. I just didn't know where they would be. He he basically switched five and four and three and two. All right. So wow. Uh, no. Uh, to quote on Shut In, that came in at number seven. Uh, Brian was right on that with three point seven million on a budget of non-existent. So I probably made its money back because it looked like it cost like a fucking uh, laundry coupon and a uh, half-eaten Snickers bar. Uh, number five, Hacksaw Ridge with ten point seven million needs uh, more. Yeah, it does. Uh, right, and I understand uh, everyone's qualms about uh, Mr. Gibson, but I've said I said this last night when I was talking with my friends at the wedding. The guy's been in movie jail for ten goddamn years. He is good. He is good to go. He says some shitty things, yes, but he's no fucking Roman Polanski or Woody Allen because they've done some gross shit. Mel Gibson said some stupid shit. 
That's all he did. We can forgive him, okay? And I think with this movie, I, I think um, people should put that aside and go watch it as a fucking film. And uh, I think we'll be blown away. Anyways, its budget is unlisted, but domestically it's got $32 million. That's good, but it, Brian said, and I agree, it needs more. Number four, Almost Christmas with $15.5 million. Uh, mm. Its budget is $17 million, and you guys know the rules. you got to double that, and you got to add P&A marketing. So it needs to make about, I'm going to say for shits and giggles, uh, maybe like 38, 40 almost uh, to break even. Um, uh, with 15, maybe it can kind of pepper in some money throughout the holiday season, so it might do okay. Um, number three is Arrival with $24 million straight up. Uh, its budget, oh dear lord, please make its money back. <sighs> its budget's forty seven. Oh to, no! To double to double that, we're looking at ninety four. And with P and A marketing, I'm gonna say it needs a cool one hundred million to break even. The fact that it only made twenty four is fucking worrisome. Okay, like look, here's the deal. We both loved it, and I I adored the film. We just talked about it like a few months ago. But here's the thing. I hate to say it. I don't think this movie's gonna make its money. I'm sorry. I hate to say it. it Paramount it, is not Paramount's yeah. not doing good this year. I'm sorry. They're not doing good in terms of money. It might not. And the thing with Denny Villeneuve new films, besides Prisoners, well, and Sicario did pretty good too. Enemy flopped, and it was a very weird, bizarre movie. Arrival's kind of the same way. It is not an Independence Day. It is not a Mars Attacks. It is definitely way different. And I think that might turn some people off. But I'm telling you guys, if you were cinephiles. Please give this movie a chance. If you fucking hate it, that's fine. You can come back at me and be like, I fucking hate it. But like, cool. Uh, why did you hate it? And I would like to know. But give it a shot. Um, and give Hacksaw Ridge a shot for sure. Uh, number two is Trolls with $35 million. Oh, Why? Um, its budget is $125 million. Jesus So I'm going to say with Christ. P&A marketing, it needs to make about 300 to break even. Right now, worldwide, it's at 200 So you know it's going to make its money back. <sighs> fucking people. Um, go see Arrival and Hacksaw Ridge, people. Please. <laughs> um, all right, and the number one, Brian nailed that one. Doctor Strange with $43 million. It's uh, Its budget is 165 so doubling that, we're looking at um, at uh, 330 And with P&A marketing, I'm going to say about 350 They probably spent about $20 million in marketing and stuff. So I'm going to say 350 to break even. And worldwide, it's at 492 Fuck nice. yeah, son. Or almost at 500 mil. Um, Very good. Yeah, that's really good. I, I like Doctor Strange. I thought it was a nice one. I gave that one like a, a uh, like a B plus, I think. Um, and uh, I believe that's it. Uh, and Doctor Strange only dropped about 49%, so that was expected, but that's actually not that big of a drop considering the movies that have come out before it. All right, guys, that will do it for this week's episode of uh, Real Me In. Uh, Brian, uh, I want to thank you for coming on. Uh, where can the peeps find you online? You can find me on Twitter at Brian Sutz98 and on YouTube at Brian Sutfield. And yes, please subscribe to Preview Party. Uh, link in the bo- what? Link in the below. Link in the description link in below. The below. It sounds like a shitty like uh, clothing store. Yo, welcome to Link in Below. Uh, uh, we have our sweaters on sale made out of like sheep pube testicles. Yeah, <laughs> that's. I wouldn't be surprised if that ever happens. Oh uh, yes, link in the description below. Um, I cannot wait to react to this Ghost in the Shell trailer, and yeah, thank you for having me on, man. Uh, no problem, and uh, you can see me and Brian's uh, show every Saturday on my channel uh, by subscribing to the YouTube page to get the top five uh, show that you all want and desire in your daily lives. My Twitter is at Real Chase Lee, and um, subscribe. Uh, and, and follow on Spreaker, iHeartRadio, iTunes, SoundCloud. Like, leave a comment, give a rating, spread it around, and tell people that this is the definitive movie fucking podcast. Now, if um, you made it through this entire podcast and you are not a movie fan, well, hopefully Brian and I convinced you to be one. Next week, guys, episode 150 fucking six. If you do your math correctly, I've done one every single week. And there's 52 weeks in a year. Times that by three. What you got? 156. So next week, guys, the three-year anniversary for the show. It is going to be a fucking big one. It might be a three-hour long show. I'm going to have Joel on my uh, my show. We're going to do, get this, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, 
Nocturnal Animals, and Manchester by the Sea. And we're going to have a special top 10 list uh, to follow after that. So it's going to be one hell of a fucking show. And I'm going to need a shit ton of tea and water to make it through so my throat does not go sore. So, yeah, next week, guys, for the three-year special, it will be a longer episode. It will be so much fun. So, uh, yeah. That will do it for this week's episode, guys, of Real Man Colin, a movie podcast. I want to thank you guys for listening. You guys are fucking dope. I love you all. Please continue to listen uh, to the show. You guys keep me going. You guys are the fucking best. And the intro and outro music is done by my friends, band Ferment Rose. Check them out in the link in the description below, as well as all the links in the description below. Peace out, guys. Have a good day, good night, whenever the hell you're listening to this. Good, 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 goodbye. I need to find a better outro. All right, see ya. 